We serve a God that's awesome. We serve a God that's great. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to give our awesome God a great praise. Can you help me bless his name? Because he's worthy. The Bible says hallelujah is the highest praise. And come on, let's give it to him today. All right? You believe that? Put your hands on the beat if you can. Come on, come on. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory above all nations. And his glory above the nations. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory above all nations. And his glory above Let's sing. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory above all nations. The, the Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory above all nations. And his glory above the so give God the highest praise, acknowledging him always. And all the people said, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Let's go from the top. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. Put your hands together like this. Put your hands together. And his glory above all nations. If you believe that, if you can shout, come on and shout unto the Lord. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. If you feel like dancing, you can dance. Come on, come on, come on. And his glory above all nations. We're going to take it out this time. Hey! So give God the highest praise, acknowledging him always. And all the people said, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah.
Well, God bless you. I'm Bishop Joseph Juan Walker III of the Mount Zion Church right here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in to our Bible study. We are excited to have you connected on today. And make no mistake about it, God has a word for your life. Man, when I tell you, you're in the right place at the right time. Trust me. I want to connect with you. Follow me on Instagram. Follow my wife. We are so, so interested in knowing who you are and connecting with you. It's very simple. Go out there, follow her, Dr. Steph Walker, me and Joseph Walker 3. We appreciate you in advance and thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much also for supporting uh, my podcast. It's called Next Level Leader. Hope you'll do that. It will bless you and I appreciate you so much in doing that. God is truly amazing. And uh, every Tuesday we drop content that'll bless your life. One of these I do want to let you know that this Revelation series, God is doing great things with it. And every Thursday throughout this series, we are allowing for 30 minutes in our virtual connect. Every Thursday night at 9 o'clock Central Standard Time, I share with folks who want to come on and just ask questions and talk to me about life. And we're going to spend about 30 minutes talking about this series of Revelation. So if there's something that is said that you have a question about, Feel free to come on Virtual Connect on Thursday nights at uh, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we'd love to hear your question and try to work through it as well. We want to grow together. This series is going to be impactful. And so many of you have commented about part one and part two. And today we're going to go into part three. It's going to be very profound. A lot of stuff we're going to cover. So I cannot wait. We're going to prepare our hearts right now to give. Let's do that. Worshiping God and our giving is such a powerful, powerful thing. And I want to appreciate all of you so much. Thank you, thank you so much for continuing to sow and believe in the vision of this house and sowing in the good ground, being tithers and givers. Thank you. Let's do that right now. You can text to give. It's on the screen right now. Or you can mail in your offering at uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church, uh, 7594 O'Hurky Boulevard, White Creek, Tennessee. Thank you so much for doing that. and We appreciate you in advance. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege we have right now to give, to study, to grow. Let your word now speak to us in a profound way that we can grow together and be students of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's get right back into this series. We're going to go into part three. And of course, the backdrop of part three of this series, we're going to be dealing with Revelations 119 as a backdrop as we go into chapter four. And I'm using Revelations 119 as, a, as really a, a context an idea of understanding how to really interpret this book, these things which shall take place after this. These things which shall take place after this. Now, chapter four begins with uh, heavenly perspectives. We're looking uh, down on the earth. And this is important because in the description of heaven, uh, John uses symbols. And these symbols are going to be important for us to understand this book because not everything is symbolic, just as the parables of Jesus. Many of the details were merely descriptive and they were not necessarily intended to, to carry a specific significance uh, of their own. Also, it's important to keep in mind that the nature of symbolism is important because the symbol is always less than the reality. The symbol is less than the reality. The reality of heaven is even greater than the description we have of it. Charles Spurgeon says something about this. He says, we may not know everything about heaven, but the book of Revelation gives as much as is good for us. We ought to be as content with that which is not revealed as with that which is. Because if God wills us not to know, we ought to be satisfied not to know. And so God has told us all about heaven and what is necessary to bring us there. And if God revealed more, it would, it would have served rather than the gratification of curiosity, it would have served that more than the increase of our own understanding of grace. And so what I mean by that is, we have to know that we, we understand heavenly things uh, by the grace of God, by what is revealed to us by his grace. And Revelation is a powerful book. In chapter 4 through, through 19, we have a section mainly concerned with God's judgment upon the world. Oh, it's going to get deep today. 
preceding Jesus' earthly reign. Now, Revelation 4, it introduces us to the place of judgment and how that place of judgment comes from God's throne. So we're going to see God's throne, judgment. We're going to see a lot here. And I want you to really begin to pay attention. So let's look at John's account of entering heaven, chapter 4. Let's go there, get something the right way, let's go to work. Now, John is called up into heaven. Revelation 4 and 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door. He says a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now, John goes up in the spirit. Okay, this is important. Revelation 4 and 2 says, Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, he says, I saw a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. One, one God. Going way back to what we know the Bible teaches us back in the old covenant, I am the one true living God, he says. There was no other God before me. So when we see there is one God on the throne. Now, I want you to see this because what John sees is so profound. He says, I saw this and I looked up and I saw this heavenly throne and, and I saw so much in there. And, and when you see the, this, this description, it is, it is so resilient, it's so powerful. He said, I saw it and uh, it, it, was, it was so impactful that John's description, Revelation 4 and 3 says, and he who sat on the throne was like jasper and sardis stone. All these different stones appearing. See, it's like it was so much light illuminating from this throne. And uh, John says a rainbow was around the throne. So you can imagine what John is seeing here. He's seeing all of these various uh, lights at the throne. The NRSV uses jasper. Uh, carnelian to describe the throne, precious stones. So John is seeing something very powerful here, this heavenly splendor of God. And the rainbow color uh, of the emerald alludes us to the throne vision in Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel speaks of this as well. And so when we look, also what's interesting is what happens around the throne. John says in Revelation 4, uh, four through seven around the throne. There were 24 thrones and on the throne I saw 24 elders clothed with white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads and the throne proceeded, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. Wow. Watch this. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. I want you to see that. I want you to see that. And he says, what's interesting in this, and I want you to really pay attention here because this is important. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third a uh, living creature had the face of a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Now, I want you to understand this. The sea of glass, I'm gonna break all this down to you in a minute. The sea of glass image is very critical because the sea of glass before the throne represents uh, the, the, the closer you get to him, the clearer your reflection of yourself becomes. So when you enter into the throne, it's as if though I see myself in my purest state, the closer I get to him. Now, let's go back to these four living creatures. We understand these creatures to be cherubims, uh, spectacular angelic beings surrounding the throne of God. They also represent the four gospels. Whoa, I want to break this down to you. These four creatures, these four creatures represent the gospels. Let me break it down. The first was like a lion, right? We see this as Matthew, the lion gospel, 
showing Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. I want you to write that down. The second was like a calf, right? The calf, seen as an ox. The ox gospel, Mark, showing the humble servanthood of Jesus Christ. The third was like a face of a man. The man, the gospel of Luke, showing Jesus as a perfect man, like the second Adam, or a father who loves his son when he goes astray, Luke 15. And the fourth, the face of an eagle, flying eagle. John is seen as the eagle gospel, showing Jesus as a man from heaven, the sky. Also the dispensation of the Holy Spirit being introduced in the gospel of John. So let's look then at John's description and what happens at the throne of God. Boy, this is good. Now, you ready to go deeper? You ready? I'm going to take you there. Revelations 4, 8 through 11 says, the four living creatures, each having six wings full of eyes, they have six wings full of eyes, right? And what makes this interest around and within, they do not rest day nor night, saying, holy, 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 Lord Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and lives forever and ever, what happens? The 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their thrones down. Wow. They take their thrones down. They cast their thrones down. This may not make sense to you, but I'm going to break it out. I'm going to make it make sense shortly. Before the throne, they say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. And you might recall in Isaiah 6, we have in the year King Isaiah died, he saw the Lord sitting high upon the throne, the train filled the temple, and above it stood seraphims, each having six wings, two covered their face, with two they covered their feet, with two they flew, cried to one another saying, holy, 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 because whatever happens around the throne is always humility and glory to God. Anytime you come before the presence of God, anytime you come before the presence of God, no matter what your title is, you have to reverence him. Remember when the wise men came and they went before baby Jesus, they knew that this was God in the earth and they fell down, opened up their treasures, they began to worship baby Jesus because you can't come into the presence of God without worshiping him and honoring him for who he is. The living creatures constantly worship God. They're cherubims. And what is a cherubim? They're wing angelic beings described in biblical tradition as attending on God. Cherubims represent an ancient Middle Eastern or as a lion or bull with eagle's wings. That's how they're represented in, in ancient Middle Eastern art. And, and, and they have human faces. And the cherubims consistently repeat the phrase, holy, holy, holy. That's what they do. Holy, holy, holy. They consistently repeat that thing. God's holy nature is declared and emphasized in a three-time repetition. Now, why is that important? Because in Hebrew, the devil repetition adds emphasis. Moses, Moses. Abraham, Abraham. You get it? But it's rare to have a threefold repetition designating the superlative that calls the attention to the infinite holiness of God. We're, we're really saying when you see it three times, you, you're talking about the infinite holiness of God. He's the only one that gets called holy, holy, holy. Man. The scripture goes on to say that the cherubims do not rest. They do not rest. They have no rest. And yet, they have no unrest either. Because the cherubims take sweet content in their continual employment. They, they, they love what they do. Holy, holy, holy. Oh God, I could stay there. And the cherubims, what is of note, and I want you to remember this, they are in angelic order, the highest order of angelic beings. The 24 elders, let's deal with that for a second. 
They worship the enthroned God. So God, the one sitting on the throne, the 24 elders take off their crowns. The elders are prompted to worship by the cherubim. And since they worship God day and night, so do the elders. All day, all night, they're worshiping before the throne of God. Now, what this should also do is prompt us as believers to worship God. Ask yourself, do you have any less praise or thanksgiving for God? When you think about all that God does for your life and you wake up in your right mind and you wake up, you have to say, man, I gotta stop complaining and just start saying, Lord, I give you glory. Do we sing as much as the angels do? Should we allow the angels to exceed us in worship? See, even if they have already exceeded us, it should be our goal to emulate them, singing praises and worship unto God. One of the fascinating things is that a lot of people tune in to the broadcast after worship. We tune in after praise. We come to church after worship because we have not understood that worship is what we give to God and his word is what he gives to us. Boy, I just said something. Worship is what we give to God. We worship God with our lips, the fruit of our lips. We worship God with our giving, but the word is what he gives to us. You can't be in a relationship where you just receive it. You got to give God. That's why they're saying, Lord, we worship you. Holy, holy, holy. Now let me, let me take this a little deeper. I'm going to open up something for you. The 24 elders worship, it was for one reason, to credit the worth and worthiness of God. Now, one of the most significant questions in, in, in biblical history and theology is who are the 24 elders? Angelic couriers, possibly representing the sum of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. The elders credited God for their own work and reward as they cast their crowns down. This is important, before the throne, as mentioned in verse 10. They recognized that their worth and worthiness belong to God and not themselves. So they understand all that we are is not of ourselves, but it's because of God. Why do they cast down their crowns? And let me put this in perspective. Remember Paul says, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith, finished my course. And there's now laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me on that day. And not just to me, but those who love his appearing. Paul was trying to say, I know there's a crown of righteousness, well, casting down the crown really is powerful because what they're saying is, Lord, you are worthy to receive honor, glory, and power. They realize that if, if God was worthy of the glory and honor and power, then God should get the crown. Watch this. The crowns mentioned in Revelation 4 and 10 are the Stephanos crowns. The crowns of victory, not royalty. After you win a race and you get the crown. They were saying, Lord, all that we've accomplished, we give unto you. We worked our entire lives for this. But Lord, before your throne, nothing matters but your glory. Ooh, we lay it down. These are crowns of achievement that a winning athlete will receive in ancient Olympic games. And the 24 elders, don't miss this. Gosh, this is good. The 24 elders represent the redeemed of God. <laughs> the redeemed of God. Through every achievement, reward they had, they gave it back to him. Because they knew and proclaimed that you are worthy to receive glory, honor. You are worthy to receive power. And the text says they all cast their crowns before the throne. There were no divided opinions in heaven, no sets, S-E-C-T-S, no, no parties, no schisms. They all are in perfect harmony and sweet accord. What one does, all do. They cast their crowns without exception before the throne. And what would it look like for all of us to practice that kind of consistency in the earth. As fellow Christians, regardless of our denominations, our, where we grew up or our race or color, what would it mean for us to get rid of everything that divided us and just say, Lord, before your throne, holy, holy, holy. 
So the devil comes in and causes so much division because he knows it disrupts worship to God because God cannot be worshiped in division. See, we have to realize that God wants us to come in the place of synergy. I do not read that there was a single elder who envied his brother's crown or said, I wish I was such at, as one as, as he is or I wish my crown looked like his crown. No, they all just said, Lord, to you be the glory. No envy, no hatred. Oh my God, I wish you could get this. You see, they were saying, Lord, you are credited for all things and by your will we exist. It's when you empty yourself and understand that all of what you is, what Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. The 24 elders, listen, the 24 elders, now I want to I I pick this up, 24 elders worship God because of his creative power and glory. And the fact that God is creator, God is creator, gives him the right to be over everything. God is creator, so we claim God, you have the right to be over everything. Even as the potter has all rights and claims over the clay, you have all right and claim over us. Just like in the book of Romans, it proves that. In Romans 9, 21, does not the potter have power over the clay and the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? You see it? This is the fondness of the way King James Version of Revelation 4 and 11. Watch this. Watch this. There is a fondness, rather, of how this is written. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things for your pleasure. They are and were created. The wonderful phrase, and for my pleasure they are and were created, reminds us all that we exist to give glory to God. The only reason why we exist is that our lives give glory to God. Our work, our praise, our giving, our living, it's all to give glory to God. It also means that we should plan ahead for that great day. Because if you and I should walk into a church building post-COVID, and we will, can you imagine what worship's going to be like when we all get back here together? Oh boy, can you imagine? I think about it all the time. I think about what it's going to feel like to be back in the house of God with the saints. But you know what? We come back in this place. Worship has to be so authentic based on what we've gone through now. I think what COVID-19 has done is shown us the authenticity of worship because you've been able to worship God in your home without keyboard, without organ, without drum. You've been at home and lifting your hands and giving God glory in your coffee table, in your bedroom. And now when you come back in, you're not prompted by anything other than the glory and the presence of God. Can you imagine that? That's how worship is going to be so powerful. And we're going to cast down our crowns at the Savior's feet. Lord, everything we think we are, we cast it down. We bow down. I, I, look, I live for the day we just rush this altar and worship. I live for the day that Boy, when I come back in this place and you come back in, you're going to be at this altar all throughout the aisles just saying, Lord, based on what we've gone through, we now know, God, we are here. We exist for only your pleasure, not for our own attention, not for our own self-aggrandizement, but because of your glory. Whew. Man, I got emotional thinking about that. I know some of you did too. But let's go to chapter five, Okay. Let's take a deep dive here. Now, chapter five, we're going to deal with the lamb, the lion, the lamb, and the scroll. This is going to be fascinating. I want you to write this down. The lion, the lamb, and the scroll. All right? Now, watch this. This is important. This is going to be an important piece. The lion, the lamb, the scroll. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? For us. Let's see. The focus of Revelation 4 was on the throne. So we saw the throne. Chapter 5 shifts the focus to the scroll being held in the hand of the enthroned Lord. So we got to deal with this scroll situation. And chapter 5 builds the case that Christ is judge. He is. And, and this account 
is told with the imagery of the lion and the lamb and the scroll, which only Jesus could open. Once Jesus opened the seven seal scroll, it was revealed that it contained a deed to all the land on the earth. In Revelation 5, John wrote about the seven seal scroll. This parchment was in essence a legal document, a legal document outlining deed information, parcels of land. There were conditions related to the opening of the scroll, though. <laughs> there were conditions. Not just anybody could open it. First, it could only be done by a man who was a descendant of Adam, right? Only by a descendant of Adam. And this man must also be deemed perfect and without sin. All of heaven and earth were searched, and no such being could be found. Here's the breakdown of this chapter. Looking for someone who is worthy to open the scroll. Let's look at it. All right? The scroll has seven seals. Seven seals. You see it? Seven seals on the scroll. It's a very unusual thing. You're going to understand this in a minute. Revelations 5, 1, 2, 3. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Now what's important to know in this is that it was an unusual scroll. It was different. It wasn't a common practice to write on both sides of the scroll. It was, you wrote on one side of the scroll, but not on both sides. And what this means is that there was so much information <laughs> that one side of the scroll could not contain it. What, what, what is it? Ancient scrolls, now, if you think about scrolls, ancient scrolls were read horizontally not vertically, not like we read. They were read this way. See it? And the rows of the scroll were on the left to the right. And the writing lay in narrow columns, about three inches wide, written on a substance somewhat like brown paper. So you remember we were in elementary school, you saw that big, thick brown paper? And the scroll was held in the left hand and unrolled with the right. And on a typical scroll like this, the book of Revelation would fill a scroll 15 feet long. So you can imagine, 15 feet long. And the scroll was sealed with seven seals, which were seven strings around the scroll. So seven strings around, that's how they would seal it. Now, what's often misunderstood here is some people in, uh, assert that there were seven sayings because there were seven seals, but that's incorrect. The seven seals are all set upon one scroll. So each of the seals had to be opened before the scroll could be read. And through the centuries, scholars, commentators suggest many different ideas for what this scroll is. Here's, a, here's just a few common suggestions. Some suggest that it's the Old and the New Testament together. Okay. Some suggest it's God's divorce against Israel, but there's very little scriptural evidence of that. Some suggest it is God's sentence against the church. And some suggest that perhaps it is the text of Revelation. But the best solution is to see the scroll as God's final will and settlement of the affairs of the universe. God's final will and settlement of the affairs of the universe. And the emphasis in this text is not the content of the scroll, but on its seals and the one who is worthy to open it. Oh boy, this is going to get good. Who is worthy? Well, we just heard Holy, 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 you are worthy in chapter 4. Jesus is worthy to open the scroll, descendant of Adam and perfect. Now, 
it's important now because the lamb appears. The lamb who had been slain. I want you to see this. The lamb who had, had been slain appears. And when he appears, the lamb with seven horns, seven eyes. I've got to explain that. Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5 rather, verse 4 through 7. So I wept because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll, so to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne, the four living creatures, in the midst of those four living creatures, remember those four living creatures? And in the midst of the elders stood the lamb as though it had been slain. Remember, Jesus Christ was the lamb who was slain. Where does that come from? Let me break it down. In the old covenant, they would bring goats and bullocks and lambs for sacrifice, but when the blood of lambs and goats were not enough, Jesus became the lamb of God, symbolic of the lamb being slain once and for all, and we were then redeemed by his blood. Hold on to that. He had been slain, having seven horns, seven horns, and seven eyes. Gosh, this is going to be interesting. A lamb that had been slain. You see the blood? Seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. John is saddened by this news, but an elder remind him that Jesus who came from Adam is perfect and was the only one that could open up. When they thought they couldn't find anyone, he says, no, there is one. And the gathering is held where Jesus is portrayed as the lamb in his reference to his first coming when he was slain, as I said, for the redemption of mankind. And this is important because the lamb is presented in a sim sympathetic way, in a powerful way at the same time. We know that he is living because the text says, stood the lamb. <laughs> Let that sink in. Stood the lamb. But he still had the marks of his previous sacrifice upon him. We know the lamb is alive. Thank God my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Watch this. And when mankind wants symbols of power, they conjure up ferocious beasts and birds and prey that represents nations and sports teams. You know how we do. But boy, the representative of the kingdom of God is a lamb which represents sacrificial love. The lamb was slain. Now the idea of the sacrifice of Jesus is still fresh and current before God. And there's nothing worn out or stale in the work of Jesus on the cross. I never can get tired of talking about the sacrifice of the lamb. And thousands of years later, it is still fresh as the day of Jesus dying on the cross. It still works for us today. That's why we sing about the blood. That's why we think about the cross. We think about the sacrifice. Never get to a point in your life where you, you, you get away from the power of what that sacrifice meant. The blood still reaches to the highest mountain and flows to the lowest valley. Blood that gives me strength from day to day. But verse 6 says that it had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that were sent out into the earth. This is fascinating. The lamb was not presented as an object of pity. The seven horns, look at this, I want you to see it. Look at it. The seven horns signify marks of omnipotence. Seven eyes signifies omniscience, which is the state of knowing everything. So the seven horns represent power, power, Horns represent power. <laughs> so shall my, he anoint my horns, and, and the psalmist says that, in fresh oil, referring to a ram dipping his, his horns in the oil of God. And eyes represent all seeing, all knowing, everything. And throughout the scriptures, scriptures rather, eyes suggest knowledge and wisdom, and horns power. 
So think about that. Eyes, wisdom, horns, power. Zechariah 3 and 9 and chapter 4 and 10 makes reference to the seven eyes of the Lord upon the stone or seven eyes. And they are eyes of the Lord. Zechariah 3 and 9 and chapter 4 and 10. See, and this scan, these eyes scan to and fro, to and fro throughout the whole earth. So the seven spirit, John uses seven spirit language to talk about the person and work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. And they're likened to the seven lamps burning near or in front of the throne of God. They're also said to be sent out into the entire earth. And they're equated with the seven eyes of the Lamb of God. And the most widely held and I think plausible view of the seven spirits of God here is that they are representative of the Holy Spirit. Because throughout the Bible, the number seven is symbolic of perfection. The Holy Spirit consists of seven spirits in this way, in this context, suggesting that the Holy Spirit brings us into a place of perfection. We aren't really complete without his Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that heaven celebrates when they see it. Oh boy. Revelation 5 ends with the great celebration of the elders and the angels preceding the opening of the scroll. And Jesus was hailed as the lamb who was slain and the only one worthy to open the scrolls. And and watch this. All the creatures around the throne in heaven shouted, Amen! Amen! Now there's some commonly, commonly asked questions I want to I address right quick. Where is heaven? Because we, we talk about heaven and heaven and well, where is heaven? I want you to pay attention to this. Think about this for a second. I want you to write it down. That's the first heaven. Because there are three heavens. The first heaven is when you look up right now in the sky, that's called the first heaven. The first heaven is where the birds fly, the planes fly. That's, that's the first heaven. The second heaven is where the planets are. That's the second heaven. And the third heaven is beyond that. It's what we believe the throne of God is in the existential realm. It is beyond that. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. And why do we say that? Because it's clear. The apostle Paul talks about having a, a, an experience where he was caught up in the third heaven. We know there's a third heaven. Beyond the sun, beyond the planets. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> All right, this is important. So when we get to chapter eight, and when you may think about what your loved ones are, they're, they're in the third heaven and uh, with the Lord. We'll talk about that. Boy, when I get to Revelation 20 and 21, we talk about heaven and when it comes down, it's going to be powerful. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand is this issue of the harp and bowl. In full gospel, we have uh, appeared on our worship experience called harp and bowl. And a lot of people say, what's a harp and bowl? I want you to always remember this because it's going to bless you. Harp and bowl. Revelations 5 and 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. All right? So they fall down. So he has a scroll in his hand, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense. See it? And which are the prayers of the saints. Oh my God. Now you got to really process this. The prayers of the saints make it to heaven. Yes, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Watch it. So when we do intercession, and we call it harp and bowl, that's the period by which we are bringing the prayers of the saints before God's people in worship. That's what intercession is, harp and bowl. We're saying the prayers of the saints are brought before the throne of God. That's what harp and bowl represents. So when the lamb took the scroll, the response was immediate. The angels joined in the worship and the lamb each having a harp. You get it? And this is important. And worship in heaven is accompanied by music. So now you have this heavenly chorus going on. 
Golden bowls are the incense, represent the prayers of the saints. In Revelation, we see just how precious the prayers of the saints are to God. Your prayers are very precious to God. It's your way of communing with God. <laughs> Maybe I should ask you, how many prayers you got in that bowl? <laughs> because God regards the prayers of the saints as sweet smelling incense, as if in the precious golden bowls. We see this correlation in Psalm 141 and 2, where it says, let my prayer be set before you as an incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Revelations 9 and 10, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us from, redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and he shall reign on the earth. My God. See, this song, y'all, honors the price of redemption, for you were slain. This song honors the worker of redemption, have redeemed us. This song honors the destination of redemption, have redeemed us to God. This song honors the payment of redemption by your blood. This song honors honors the scope of redemption. Every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This song honors the length of redemption have made us kings and priests to our God. And this song honors the result of redemption and we shall reign on the earth. Man, let me tell you something. And then there's this marvelous worship around the throne. Y'all, this is going to be the culmination, but this is going to bless you. What we're going to see now is Revelations 5, 11 through 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, living creatures and elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 <laughs> and thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is he is the lamb that was slain. It was voices of 10,000s and thousands. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and honor and glory and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Can you imagine what this looks like? <sighs> Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard John said they were saying blessings and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures, the Gospels, said, Amen. Amen means it is so, so be it. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who was forever and ever. Oh my God. Can you imagine that on that day, they are falling down before his presence saying, you alone are worthy to open the scroll. No one can do it but you. And they fall down and everything that was created by him, everything in the earth, under the earth, gave him glory. Child of God, I, 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 I tell you, if there was a revelation in revelation, if the birds of the air still give him glory, if the cow got sense enough to say moo moo, the chicken got sense enough to cluck. Certainly God's finest creation got sense enough to just say, Lord, you're worthy. What John saw, you have to understand it in the context of what was, what is, and what is to come. And when you think about what's happening in the world today, when we are worshiping people, things, God is saying to us that I am bringing my people to a place where they realize that I alone am worthy. And until you understand that, you will never tap into the glory of God. Right now, I just want you to say, Lord, you're worthy. You alone are worthy to receive honor and glory. God, you alone are worthy. To God be the glory. 
for the things he has done, for the things he is doing, and for the things he shall do. That day is coming, but right now, that day should be for us now. And our way of worshiping him is with our lives. And if you're watching this and you need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, boy, I tell you, you need to get that right right now. Come on. We'll receive you right now. I want you to email me at salvation at mtzionnashville.org. I want you to connect with me. Connect with our ministry. Because I want you to know Jesus is coming back. All of what we're teaching in this book of Revelation, it's going to happen. Oh, it's going to happen. But I want to make sure that I am in that number. I can't wait to share that with you next week. Listen, thank you for watching. I want you to share this with as many people as you can. If you want to come on Virtual Connect tomorrow night, Thursday night, 9 o'clock p.m., and maybe talk a little bit more about this, you maybe you have questions about, now I'm answering questions about what I talked about, not what I'm going to talk about, okay? So just stay tuned. This series is going to bless you. Thank you. This is part, you know, a great part three. We got part four coming up. So, you know, stay tuned. It's going to bless you. I promise you. This is going to be amazing. I cannot wait. I hope to see you next week. I pray God's blessings be upon you. Thank you for tuning in. And may God bless you. And may God keep you. Is our prayer. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to the Bible study today, and I pray you will bless. You know, it is our hope this year that we can help you to grow, to be a better disciple of Jesus Christ. And to that end, we hope you will continue to stay connected to this ministry as we're going to bring a relevant word to you every single week. Thank you so much for also supporting this ministry. And if you didn't get an opportunity earlier to give, I pray that you will give by one of the platforms you see right here. I want to make sure you do just that because your giving allows us to continue to touch the lives of God's people. Thank you. Whether you text to give, whether you mail it in, know we appreciate you so very, very much. So thank you again. And I pray God's blessings be upon you and yours. Until next time, God bless.